Well, to understand uh, North Carolina politics, you've got to understand both the past, but also the future immigration into North Carolina. And the past immigration back in the 16 and 1700s really meant that North Carolina had three distinct areas. One is in the Western Mountains, one is in the Piedmont, which in French means foothills, and then the other is the eastern part, which is Raleigh East. And in each one of those segments, you had Germans and Irish and Presbyterian and Baptists and whole different segments of uh, cultures and food and people and accents all within North Carolina. So that really even today contributes to the diversity of politics. But since the 1960s, we've also seen this divergence of people from all over the country moving to North Carolina with New Jersey accents or Ohio accents or even California accents that are also contributing greatly to the very unique diversity of Republicans, Democrats, and independents, which probably represents the nation extremely well. Uh, the politics of North Carolina is very unpredictable and the people are very independent in their voting. As you can see, I'm the first Republican governor in over 20 years. And, uh, and to win, I had to get a lot of Democratic vote and a lot of independent vote to win right here in North Carolina. Uh, but uh, the Obama machine was so powerful here in North Carolina regarding get out the vote efforts that it stunned us. And we lost the closest election in the nation. And it was primarily due to national politics having an impact on the gubernatorial election and what we call straight ticket voting. But in 12, uh, I was given another opportunity to sell myself and build relationships. And I was a big city mayor in Charlotte. No one from Charlotte had ever been elected statewide. So I, it took me four years to build relationship. This is a state where people have to trust you, have to know you, have to understand you, especially if you're from a big city like Charlotte. And Charlotte's a major metropolitan area now. And, and the people gave me that second opportunity, which is very rare in politics, to to build that relationship. I was actually born in Columbus, Ohio, and my dad was a small town city council member in Worthington, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus. And uh, my parents, when they were alive, told me stories that I used to go to all the council meetings and take notes. Now, they couldn't read my notes, but I took notes. So obviously, the uh, public service appealed to me even when I was five, six, seven years old. And then uh, in high school is probably when it really got to me. I started following presidential campaigns and even started collecting presidential posters. And, uh, and I ran for student body president in high school. And that was probably my first entree into politics was running for student body st uh, government association. And I won in an upset. Uh, very similar to my election this time. I actually used to be a Democrat up until uh, Actually, it was watching. I changed the Republican Party in Jimmy Carter's second term when uh, he was running for re-election and Ted Kennedy came onto the stage and refused to take Jimmy Carter's hand. And I went, that's not a party I want to be a part of. It had gotten too liberal for me. And I'd found myself become a little more fiscally conservative and conservative in other issues that uh, as I grew older. and. Um, I, I changed to Ronald Reagan at that point in time and went, I, I see a difference between the two parties. I was not a Ted Kennedy fan. I thought he had too, too much control over the Democratic Party. Um, it's interesting, as I've grown older, my, my political hero is Eisenhower. And I don't think we as Republicans talk about Eisenhower enough. We all tend to talk about Reagan. When in fact, Eisenhower was a, not only a great allied hero during the war, but I thought he was a very visionary president, especially in the way he built infrastructure in connecting the east to the west, uh, connecting the suburbs with the rural areas. And I actually borrowed from Eisenhower when I was mayor of Charlotte, and I'm borrowing from him now as governor of North Carolina and trying to use infrastructure to rebuild our economy. Well, first of all, to brag on North Carolina, we're the best place to live, work, and raise a family. I mean, we have a quality of life that's second to none, the weather, we have the mountains, we have the Piedmont, we have the most beautiful beaches in the world. So we have cho a lot of choice regarding quality of living. We have a lot of choice regarding education. And we have a lot of choice regarding employment, regarding working for big banks or manufacturing or working in agriculture, which is still very, very important to our state. 
the tough part about North Carolina right now is our unemployment has become very high uh, because the rural, small rural towns, uh, manufacturing just shut down the last 10 to 15 years and had a tremendous negative impact on our, on our, uh, on our rural towns between the populations of 10 to 50,000 people. Our metropolitan areas also went through dynamic change where we've become major banking centers where I was mayor of Charlotte. This area in Raleigh is a major research center, high-tech center, and my goal now is to connect the rural areas with those small towns and also make agriculture uh, an enterprise for future research and future exports for our nation. So high-tech and low-tech combine the two together. I think North Carolina's future is very bright, but we've got to get people back to work, uh, especially in the private sector. Uh, certain areas of our state have been decimated uh, during the past five to six years, and we have one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation, and most people don't realize that because our urban areas, Raleigh, Triangle area, and, and Charlotte and Greensboro are pretty well known for the places to live and work, but uh, we've got small town America, just like in the Midwest, that is going through some some generational change now, and we've got to reinvent the future for these small towns. My biggest challenge in the first ten, uh, my first term is dealing with the operations of government. Um, most people, at, in, when they think of politics, whether it be in state government or federal government, they only think of legislative battles. And I think the media uh, does too much of this too. One of the biggest problems of government right now is basic, efficient, customer-friendly operations. And right now, the operations in areas such as healthcare is just broke. And I'm spending, as the member of the executive branch, heading up the executive branch, 90% of my time on operations. Just getting out the basic work in an efficient and effective way. And what I found out um, is it's broken. It's broken at the federal level and it's broken at the state level. And that's one of the reasons I think people are so disenchanted with government is that uh, we're not real good at delivering services in a cost-effective way. And, and I don't think politicians and the media are talking about that enough. And I think the health care issue that uh, we're dealing with, with what they refer to as Obamacare, the issue is not just the policy. The issue is how do you implement it in a cost-effective way? How do you even find the qualified people to implement it in, a, in an efficient operations. And very few people talk about operations. I gotta get the federal government to un let us at the state level have some flexibility. I've asked the administration, let us reform Medicaid, but I have to go beg them for waivers. I have to ask them for permission to let me drill offshore the coast of North Carolina for oil and natural gas. And they're not giving me that permission. And it's just, it's just like it's, it's so tied up there, and uh, both at the White House and Congress, that they're not let the governors do what we need to do to uh, unleash the economy and have more efficient government. They tie our hands an awful lot. I think the national media spends um, a lot of time on the Confederacy of the South, when in fact the major history that occurred in North Carolina was not the Civil War. Uh, in fact, almost no Civil War battles were fought in North Carolina. It was the Revolutionary War that was primarily fought in North and South Carolina, not even up north. Uh, the national media, even in the history books, don't realize that Nathaniel Green and Washington spent an incredible amount of time in North Carolina. This, George Washington's statue is both outside the state capitol building and inside our rotunda. That's still, the Revolutionary War probably has a bigger impact on North Carolina still today. It's its independence, it's its freedom, it's its feeling that um, we were a part of the Declaration of Independence. In fact, we say in Mecklenburg County in Charlotte that the first Declaration of Independence was actually signed in Charlotte, North Carolina, not in Philadelphia. And uh, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, the Battle of Cowpens, the Battle of Kings Mountain, this is where Cornwallis got beat and then um, waved the white flag in Yorktown, but it was only after uh, the revolutionary major battles right here in the South. So I've got to teach the, the national media more about a lot of the history here is 
more based upon the Revolutionary War than even the Civil War. It is interesting how the history of our nation does not mention George Washington's involvement in the South. His bust is right here in my office because he was here in both Raleigh and Charlotte and Greensboro and spent a lot of time in North Carolina. So that's probably had a more cultural significance to North Carolina than, than any other time period.